On the 25th of July 1944, seven weeks after the Allied landings in Normandy, the American First Army launched Operation Cobra, an offensive which aimed to pierce the German defences in the St. Lo area and then facilitate the breakout from the Normandy beachhead. Although German resistance was tougher than anticipated, by the 27th of July, First Army had achieved a breakthrough, prompting General Bernard Montgomery, the Commander-in-Chief of 21st Army Group, to order the British 2nd Army to amass its strength in the coumont villers picage area and launch an immediate offensive to support the American advance. General Montgomery later explained that, It was now essential to ensure that all our efforts went to further the speed and progress of the American drive. The situation was favourable for delivering a very heavy blow on the right wing of 2nd Army in the Coumont sector. If 2nd Army could regroup speedily and launch a thrust in strength southwards from the Coumont area, the effect would be to get behind the German forces which had been swung back to face west by the American breakthrough. Any attempt by the enemy to pivot in the Coumont area would thus be frustrated as we should knock away the hinge. Codenamed Operation Bluecoat, 2nd Army's attack went in on the 30th of July, with four divisions up front and two in reserve. Among the four leading the operation was the 15th Scottish Division, whose advance started just after 0700 and immediately ran into difficulties, as stout German resistance, combined with the Normandy Bocage, slowed the progress of its three forward battalions. The effect of these difficulties meant that it wasn't until 0830 that the edge of the first objectives were reached, by which time the second phase of the advance was getting underway. Involved in this second phase were two battalions of infantry, supported by two tank battalions of Churchill tanks, all of which were tasked with moving through the forward units and breaking out towards the second objective line. This move, however, was hampered by the fact that the first objectives are yet to be secured, and unsurprisingly, as soon as the follow-up battalions reached the front line, they became separated from one another as the infantry were drawn into the fight to secure set vents and lutein wood, whilst their supporting Churchill tanks pushed on and managed to pierce a hole through the central German defences. The success enjoyed by the two tank battalions led to an unusual decision being made by Major General Gordon Macmillan, the commander of the 15th Scottish Division, who instructed the tanks to continue on alone through the enemy positions and establish themselves deep behind enemy lines on the second objectives with the intention being that the infantry would follow up and rejoin them later in the day. This was an unusual order because not only did it break away from British tactical doctrine, which emphasised the need for close infantry tank cooperation, but it was also to be a huge gamble, as the flanks of both units would be wide open to potential German counter-attacks. Nevertheless, as Brigadier Gerald Verney, the commander of the 6th Guards Tank Brigade, recalled after the war, the situation throughout Phase 2 had been confused, and my recollections are of many conversations over the air with the two tank battalions, on the rival themes of hurrying on to the objective, or staying close to the infantry, whose whereabouts were continually uncertain. It was becoming clear that we would never get to the second objectives at the rate we were going. It seemed that the only hope was to take a chance and push on alone. Accordingly, at 0930 on the 30th of July 1944, the tankers of the 3rd Battalion the Scots Guards and the 4th Battalion the Coldstream Guards moved off and against minimal opposition, both battalions succeeded in reaching their respected objectives by late afternoon, marking a penetration of over 4 kilometres into enemy territory. On the right flank, the 3 Scots Guards established themselves atop a key feature known as Point 226, with two of its tank squadrons holding the hill itself whilst the 3rd Squadron was held in reserve near the village of La Loge. By 1530, the battalion was firmly consolidated on point 226 and awaiting the arrival of the infantry, the lead elements of which, from the 2nd Battalion, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, linked back up with the Scots Guards just after 1600. On their arrival, the Argyles disposed themselves around the objective, with one rifle company in La Loge, another near a crossroad on the right flank and the remaining two companies dug in on point 226 itself. Thereafter, a period of two hours elapsed in which very little activity took place on the hill, until around 1800 when German artillery began to target the British positions. The war diary of the Free Scots Guards details that. The enemy began to shell and mortar the position very heavily with 15cm guns and 12cm mortars, and the Churchill tanks were forced to close down, at least one, Captain Nigel Beeson's, being hit by shell fire and knocked out. 
About 10 minutes later, an armoured counter-attack was launched by the Germans from thick cover about 400 to 600 yards to the left rear of S Squadron. Having used a farm and an adjacent orchard to cover their approach, two German Jag Panther tanks suddenly emerged on the left flank of the Scots Guards. Covered by a third Jag Panther, which remained in position near the farmhouse, the two attacking German tanks slowly rolled up the eastern slope of point 226, and in quick succession they knocked out the three Churchill tanks covering the extreme left of S Squadron. With the British left flank blown wide open and the element of surprise having been attained, the Jag Panthers continued their advance up the hill and into the heart of S Squadron's position, for where they accounted for a further eight Churchill tanks knocked out. By that time, elements of the two other squadrons in the Free Scots Guards had opened up on the Jag Panthers, both of which soon veered off down the southern slope of point 226 and disappeared into the fog of war, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. Captain William Whitelaw, the officer commanding S Squadron, and who was moving between his reserve and forward tanks at the time of the counter-attack, later recounted. I should like to emphasise now that all six tanks my two left-hand troops, together with the battalion second in command's tank and my second squadron headquarters tank, had all been knocked out in the time that it took me to drive up one fairly small field. In fact, a matter of a little over a minute. I mention this because it shows how very accurate and quick the German shooting was. In the space of up to five minutes, the two Jag Panthers had knocked out 11 Churchill tanks, of which 10 belonged to S Squadron and the other to Battalion Headquarters of the Free Scots Guards. In addition to the loss in tanks, the British suffered heavy casualties as a result of the counter-attack, with 24 men sadly losing their lives and a further 18 becoming wounded. Following the onslaught, S Squadron had effectively ceased to exist and was reduced to only four Churchills. In spite of this, the remnants of the squadron remained on point 226 until 1930 on the 30th of July, when it was pulled out of the line to rest and reorganise, with its place on the hill being taken over by 6-pounder and 17-pounder anti-tank guns, as well as M10 Achilles tank destroyers of the 91st Anti-Tank Regiment.